we'll go now and tour um, my husband Mike's and my garden. Um, we live in San Pablo. And so the goals of this talk, I hope to help you avoid the arduous and circuitous gardening path that I took to get to the garden that I have today. I'd like to inspire you to garden for wildlife if Doug didn't already do that for you. I'll show you how we transformed our garden, uh, feature great native plants for the San Francisco Bay Area. And I'd like to show you some of the photos of birds, butterflies, and bees that I have seen in my garden and that you could see in yours as well. So let me start my garden journey where probably many of you did as well. I was raised in a house with a lawn. I'm from Los Angeles. I was raised about six miles from the airport. Uh, in my late teens and 20s, I spent six years living overseas, three years in the Caribbean and three years between Australia and New Zealand. And I dog trotted around much of the rest of the world. And this is me actually in the blue shorts uh, on the bow of that boat, working as a dive master in the Bahamas. And on the left, I'm uh, visiting a large grouper named Hot Lips. Um, the reason I mention this is that this was a really fun and interesting life, but um, the reason I brought it up is that when I bought my house in San Pablo in 1988, I had no gardening experience. The house had uh, pyracantha, Himalayan blackberry, ivy, junipers, box hedges, weird South African plants, and that was not the kind of garden that I envisioned. So I put in lawns. Um, I live on a hillside. You can see I have a lawn, my sloping front lawn there, and even a lawn on this like pretty, uh, you know, slopey part in the back. Um, and I felt that, you know, I had done the right thing as a new homeowner. I also put in the roses that are there on the right. And that was a hard job. They were, I was a single woman. It was hard for me to dig those roses in, but I, I worked hard and I felt like that's what I should do as a new homeowner. But after a while, I realized that I didn't want to be using all that water on a lawn and or spraying my roses to get rid of the rust. And I realized that the lawns and roses should go. So I got a recommended plant list from our water district, East Bay Mud, and took out the lawns and replaced them with plants from the Mediterranean, South Africa, and Australia. And I felt good about this as it seemed like that was really what a responsible homeowner was supposed to do. And then I heard Malcolm Margolin speak, and he is an author and the founder of Heyday Books here in the San Francisco Bay Area, and he was a hypnotic speaker. He wrote this book, The Ohlone Way, about Native American life in the East Bay before Europeans arrived. And in his talks, he painted pictures of what the Bay Area was like 300 years ago, uh, this land of plenty, this kind of enchanting land where tule elk could be seen grazing in herds of hundreds, and pronghorn antelope bounded through bunch grass meadows, leaping 10 to 20 feet in a single bound. And in those days, five runs of salmon migrated through the bay and up into the creeks to spawn. The creeks were so full of them that early European settlers said you could walk across the creeks on the back of salmon and not get your feet wet. And migrating birds in flocks of millions darkened the sky for days on end. And how, when they were startled, the flapping of their wings sounded like thunder. Condors with nine-foot wingspans soared overhead. River otters were a common sight in streams. And there were thousands of sea otters in San Francisco Bay. Red-legged, yellow-legged, and Pacific chorus frogs sang love songs from the edges of streams, ponds, seeps, and vernal pools. There were so many red-legged frogs that they became a delicacy during the gold rush and were served to hungry miners in San Francisco restaurants. The magnificent oak woodlands that harbored more life than any other terrestrial plant community would have been a flutter with butterflies and moths and the wide variety of birds that feed upon them and their caterpillars. Songbirds, like the Hutton's vireo would flit through the trees, snapping up insects in flight. It would have been a noisy place with Western meadowlarks, Northern flickers, American kestrels, and California thrashers singing and calling to each other. 
This is a postcard on the left from the early 1900s of an oak tree in San Jose with a small person for scale. And on the right is a painting from 1877 of the Oaks of Oakland. And this, is, this area is Madison and 8th Street, which is near where the Oakland Museum is now. There were vast meadows of long lived bunch grasses that once surrounded San Francisco Bay and clothed the valleys and hills, providing a rich tapestry of forage on which the elk and antelope would graze. In spring, the hills were covered with wildflowers. At times, patches of one color were a mile or more across. There were electric yellow buttercups and tarweeds, purple lupin and yellow lupin, lavender gilia and phasalia, orange poppies, bright pink clarkia and owl's clover, cream cups, red Indian paintbrush, and a hundred other variety of annuals. Entire plains and hillsides were covered with rose, scarlet, yellow, orange, and blue. So after hearing this and realizing you know, why the area was so fantastic, I wanted to take my lot and try to make up for the habitat loss that was caused by the construction of my house and the buildings that I used, like the grocery store and schools and the library and the roads. So I took out the non-native ornamentals from Australia, South Africa, and the Mediterranean that I had put in earlier. And in the next generation, I designed a native plant garden myself using natives from throughout California because that was what was available at that time about 30 years ago. And it was not lovely. It's really hard to design a garden. Uh, and my husband and his mom weighed in. And I have to say that my husband and his mom, well, his mom has died, but they, they are the loveliest people. They're tactful and kind and gentle and positive and careful. But they both told me separately that if I ever wanted anyone to garden with California native plants, I should not let them see our garden. So at that point, I realized that we needed professional help. And so we got it. We uh, hired Four Dimensions Landscape Company to help us design our garden. And so these are some of the lessons from my arduous journey. Hire a designer, either for a consultation or to give you a full design. And you'll find a list uh, on the Bring You Back the Native Garden Tours website under Find a Designer. Hire a designer who specializes in designing California native plant gardens. Um, and the reason is that if you hire someone whose expertise and the plants they know how to use are non-native plants, then they're going to plant your garden with non-native plants. It's just what happens. I've seen it happen so many times. So go for someone who specializes in California native plants. Um, either shop at our local native plant nurseries where you're only going to walk out with a native plant or if you uh, buy from a nursery that carries others make certain that what you're buying is native if that's what you want um it's easy to get confused and it's easy to get kind of sidetracked i think if you're in uh nurseries that carry both natives and non-natives so you might want to browse calscape you can go to calscape.org type in your address and it will tell you what plants are local to your area. And I often go to the Las Politas Native Plant Nursery website, which has been a great source of uh, information for me. So here we go. Here is our lot. Um, we have a slope, that little thing in the back we call the shed. Uh, it was overflow housing for kids uh, maybe 50 years ago who, when the family lived in our tiny house. Um, and look where the lawn is there just behind the trampoline. So that became this pond. And I have to say the pond has really brought birds into our yard and it's been such a pleasure for us to hear uh, the water trickle. So some of the things you might wanna note are this California lilac, the purple blue in the center of the photo. It's actually in flower right now. It's a lovely plant, delicious smell. The uh, yellow flower that you see is the aquatic monkey flower. Uh, it's in the pond and in the back of the photo, the white, the tall white ones are cow parsnip. They're a really fun plant and I'll show you another later on that they just grow super rapidly. Uh, Susan talked about how the birds like to perch on something before they go down to water. So on the left, those tall, thin 
uh, rushes sticking up or bulrush. And really from the hour we planted the bulrush, the birds come, they land on them, they bob up and down, the, the uh, plant bobs under their weight. When they make sure it's safe, they hop down to the pond to bathe and drink and splash. There are also juncus, uh, common rush, are these uh, large plants up on the hillside. Here's another before view. Uh, we took 40,000 pounds of concrete out of our backyard. That's the Royal Weed. Uh, we was really Pete Fayou's uh, hardworking crew from East Bay Wilds. And here's another photo of the yard now. So, um, okay. Here's um, moved a little bit to the right, to the south of our lot. I'm looking up, look at the stairs in particular, because they were replaced with these stairs, uh, which are actually uh, California, uh, let me see, what are they? The stairs are granite. Uh, they came from the city of San Francisco. They were curbstone. It probably came from Hetch Hetchy 100 years ago. And when the city does renovation projects, this curbstone comes up for sale every once in a while, and it made just perfect stairs. On the left is a plant. It's a California buckwheat. It's like the, the hugest California buckwheat that I've ever seen. Um, it is a wonderful uh, habitat plant. I just, in the pandemic, we spent a lot of time outside and I have seen so many birds, uh, not birds, but uh, butterflies and bees and flies and other insects on it. It's just really fun. Um, on the right, uh, in the lower where those kind of two poppy blossoms are is some milkweed. And we've had monarch butterflies uh, lay eggs in our yard. And the bottom here by that um, orange planter pot is some cow parsnip growing in. And lest I seem like completely intolerant of anything that's not a native, we actually have a dozen fruit trees in our yard. So hanging over the stairs, you can see some apples there in the tree and the trees line the perimeter of our lot and they make a nice uh, screening. I'm standing at the top of our lot now and looking down and take a look at the stairs again, because that's kind of what will show up really. Um, and here is our after photo. I should say that these um, stepping stones, some of them were painted. They had yellow or blue or red paint on the sides. And one was stenciled SFPD, which we thought was really fun. Um, I like the wild look. I don't referee much. I I like to see where the plants move and where they enjoy it. And I find it so fun that here between the steps of uh, at, at the top here is soap root, just growing up in this harsh environment. It gets no water, it's dry and it's hot, and yet the soap root pops up there. Um, down below, you can see the back of that uh, California buckwheat. On the right is a yellow lupin, ye uh, flowering yellow there on the bottom right. And on the left in flower, you see the white blossoms of the uh, apple tree. So our yard was such a wreck that we just took it down to bare dirt. And Michael Filgen from Four Dimensions Landscape uh, created our design and he chose the plants. And uh, my friend Kelly Marshall, who's a beautiful garden designer, she came out one day too and helped us throw ropes and hoses around. So we got basic layout for our yard. But uh, take a look at the house because that's what you'll see next. All right, another photo. Uh, but anyway, this is the finish. So on the right is a California sage. They're closest to us, an Artemisia. There's a, the tall kind of a yellowy green one is a bulrush that's actually in the pond. Um, then I have a number of pond plants here. That's the yellow monkey flower in the pond. And to the left is... Um, yellow lupin, and at the bottom, I don't know, maybe it's aster there, the purple. And then across the way, you can see some of the fruit trees bordering the fence. Uh, this is a granite bench, and this is cow parsnip. So it's a herbaceous perennial that uh, disappears at the end of summer and fall, and then it shoots up in spring just really rapidly and puts out these gigantic, almost tropical looking leaves and then creates these large flower heads you can see on the right. Um, I just saw an uh, anise swallowtail butterfly on it uh, yesterday that uh, I, I was perhaps laying eggs because it was just sitting there for a while. Don't know what else it would be there. On the left, you kind of, kind of see that pinky flower is a hummingbird sage. 
on the bottom underneath the bench, miner's lettuce is growing rampantly around our garden. The ferns on the bottom right are California polypody, and there's some snowberry back there. So this is a shady area uh, against the fence, and it's also area that when we water the fruit trees get some water. So now we're in the front yard. So my husband and I planted that oak on the left 30 years ago when it was six inches tall. And we planted the buckeye on the right 25 years ago from a seed. And it's about 25 feet tall and the oak is about 30 feet tall, something like that. The trees have both been such a pleasure. My office looks into them and I see the bush tits gleaning insects from the branches of the oak and the swallowtail butterflies nectaring on the flowers of the buckeye. And it's been so nice that really just in the lifetime of our son, you know, we've seen these trees grow up to be these magnificent, you know, assets to our neighborhood. And it really changed the whole character of our front yard. Mike and I had a major house remodel done during the pandemic. And the front and side yards looked like this during construction. So our work was done in 2020 and we moved back home in 2021. And um, so Michael Filgen helped us again with the front yard and, yard. and here we're looking at a list of uh, potential plants and Michael made this list up. And what I love about it is that not only does it have the basics, like what kind of plant it is, is it a tree or is it a shrub and what kind of light does it need? But Michael used information from the Doug Tallamy section on the Garden Tours website to list the number of caterpillars and ants uh, and butterflies, uh, sorry, of butterflies and moths that could lay eggs on that plant. So it was very easy for me to choose the plants I wanted. I could just run my thumb down the list, see which numbers were highest on the Ptolemy index, and those were the plants that we put in. So here we are walking to our front door and from the bottom here, the green plant with no uh, flowers on it is a Santa Cruz Island buckwheat. On the right of that, we have native strawberry as ground cover. The flowering red plant on the left is California native fuchsia. The yellow is goldenrod. Um, and the beautiful grass near the gate, you can just kind of see its lovely form is melic grass, which I'm really enjoying. Um, I love this gate, so I thought I would talk about it for a moment. Um, I didn't want this kind of barricade, palisade look, but we were looking for something that would be inviting yet also secure. And Mike found this metal grill online for $120, and we had the gate built around it. In the shade of the front yard, in the shade of the oak, the front yard is growing in. Uh, these are oak woodland plants, including sword ferns and coastal wood fern, Douglas iris, fescue, pink flowering currant, huckleberry, cow parsnip, coffeeberry, hazelnut, snowberry, thimbleberry. And I'd like to talk a little bit now about some of my favorite plants, and I'll start with the oak. So it has just been magnificent. I love how many, um, what a powerhouse tree this is and what I feel that we are doing for the environment by having an oak in our front yard. And I regret that my husband and I did not strew acorns up and down our street many years ago, but we kind of strew them in Buckeye seeds now. Uh, workhorses for sunny areas in our garden are the manzanita on the left and the California lilac on the right. Both of these plants are beautiful, evergreen, drought tolerant. They're great plants for wildlife. They're both keystone species. They both come in forms that range from prostrate, so just a couple of inches high, so they make a great ground cover, to 20 foot tall shrubs. Uh, the California lilac on the right was planted just over a year ago from a one gallon pot, and it's now more than three feet tall. About 120 species of butterflies and moths can lay their eggs on California lilac and nearly 70 on manzanita. The lavender aster on the left is super easy to grow. Here it is uh, growing in uh, among our uh, stepping stones on the hillside in the backyard. 65 species of lepidopterans can lay eggs on it. On the right is monkey flower. This is a hardy plant that attracts hummingbirds with its long tubular flowers. 
I have it in kind of a shady area in my yard, so it keeps a little bit better. It doesn't get quite as dry and crispy as it does in sunny areas, but it will also, you know, uh, do perfectly well in a hot and sunny area of your yard. On the left here is a hummingbird sage. It's uh, framed against our compost bin. And on the right is, uh, so its leaves have a delicious scent and it has these long, beautiful flower stalks. If you plant it near a path, you should brush it. You can smell it as you're walking uh, by. On the right is the aptly named bee plant. And bee plants like shade and uh, coolness and a bit of moisture. It also likes to move around. So I enjoy seeing where bee plant goes in my garden. Both of these plants spread, so you need to take that into consideration. Uh, bees love the bee plant and variable checker spot butterflies lay their eggs on it. On the left is California native fuchsia and uh, the goldenrod make a nice pair as they bloom at the same time as you might have seen in the uh, photo of the walkway leading up to our front door. Fuchsia attracts hummingbirds with its long tubular red flowers and 55 species of butterflies and moths can lay their eggs on goldenrod. On the left is a native strawberry in flower. We use it as a ground cover. This is another keystone species. And uh, you can see it here growing under our dryer vent. So this is a hot area. It doesn't get any water. It's blasted by dryer heat. Um, so the, the, uh, uh, the um, strawberry is doing really well here along with uh, uh, common rush, the tall one, which is next to it. And those are, uh, let me see, coral bells uh, on the left-hand side and Douglas iris are in the bottom of the screen. Well, the common name of this plant is hedge nettle. It doesn't sting. Uh, this plant is spreading nicely around my garden uh, in both, uh, it kind of likes, I guess, partial shade. It has attractive pink flowers and I've seen caterpillars on it, which I have really enjoyed. And here are two wildflowers that reseed well in my garden. There's the pink clarkia and the purple gilia. The clarkia is from local seed that a friend gave me. And I love knowing that this plant could have been growing in this area for hundreds of years. The gilia is a super tough plant and it comes up between the flagstones in our garden. So it's hot, it never gets any water, you know, occasionally they get tread upon. I find it really fun to have a path of wildflowers. So I welcome their popping up wherever they want to. Uh, my friend Bob Sorensen gave me some buttercup seeds, and these buttercups with their amazing yellow flowers are among my favorites. Uh, they're growing in a few different areas of my garden at this moment. They're in flower now, and I'm really hoping that they spread around. This photo shows the kind of rambunctious growth in springtime that I really enjoy. There's uh, on the right, yellow lupin. Uh, there's orange poppy moving left. There's yellow aquatic monkey flower. And then the plants growing between the flagstones there are the gilia, which are just starting to flower now. In the front, the tall spires are um, bee plant. This is a narrow leaf milkweed. Um, and if you've grown milkweed, you know if you have milkweed, you get aphids, which you see on the right there. And that's really a good thing as aphids are at the base of the food chain. Shortly, shortly after aphids appear, so do ladybugs and surfid flies and other creatures that control the aphid populations. I used to hose the aphids off or rub them off with a paper towel, but now I just leave them alone. And if you do as well, you'll shortly see ladybugs come in. Mike calls it hoovering up the stem like a vacuum. They, they go up and down and they just nosh on aphids and will clean them off. In addition to monarch butterflies, when we planted milkweed, we also got the milkweed bug. And I was so excited when we first saw the milkweed bug in our garden. It came to us because we had the milkweed just like the monarchs come to us because we have milkweed. So native plants in our garden and the pond have really brought in the wildlife. Nothing much was happening here ecologically when I bought the house. But since we have put in the natives, we've seen 30 species of birds in our little lot in San Pablo. Our lot is uh, 5,000 square feet. So here are some of the birds that I have seen in our yard. On the left is a northern flicker. Uh, let's see, sorry. Oh, sorry, on the left is a tanager. 
Western Tanager, and this is a pair of snuggling morning doves, which mate for life. On the left is a northern flicker and a hooded oriole. They're so bright. It's always very exciting when they come to us. Here is a robin and a hooded oriole in the pond. And these are lesser goldfinches taking baths. We have had bush tits nest in our garden twice, once right outside a bedroom window and the other time right outside of our kitchen window. So we were able to watch the two busy and hardworking parents going back and forth all day, bringing food to their chicks. Recently, I bought a $99 Sandmark macro lens. It comes with a case that fits on my iPhone and a lens that screws into the case. And with this lens, I've taken these photos in my garden. This was one of the first photos I took with my new Sandmark lens. It's a close-up of the California buckwheat blossoms. This lens is so easy to use. It's been so fun. Here is a honeybee on an aster flower on the left and a wool carter bee on hedge nettle on the right. And I just saw a wool carter bee again uh, yesterday at my um, California buckwheat, which was very exciting. And have you ever seen anything as adorable as this sleeping baby caterpillar, which I found in the leaf litter and the wood chips. So the lesson here is leave the leaves as the pupa of butterfly and moths, almost all of them spend the winter in our leaf litter. So if we rake it up or compost it and put it in the green waste bin, we're just throwing butterflies and moths away. Let it compost in place so the butterflies and moths can emerge in the spring. Here is a monarch caterpillar on our narrow leaf milkweed and the adult that had just emerged uh, from its chrysalis in our backyard. This is an Anna swallowtail caterpillar that was on cow parsnip. And this adult butterfly, actually Stephanie Froegel took this uh, adult photo that is not from my yard, but the caterpillar is. And I'm so proud I took this photo on the left. It's Ackman blue caterpillar on cow parsnip. It was just about a quarter of an inch long. And I was out prowling in my yard, just searching for caterpillars to see if I had any. And I saw this tiny little pink thing with my macro lens. I could just see how amazing it is. And this is the Ackman blue caterpillar on the right. I didn't take that photo on the right, but I did take the um, caterpillar. So this was very extremely thrilling for me. And do you see the inchworm on this goldenrod on the left? So inchworms have these little pro legs just at the front and back. So when they want to move, they draw themselves up. They inch up or measure the earth. Uh, this is a geometrid moth caterpillar on the goldenrod. And here is another caterpillar on the hedge nettle. And I'm just showing you all my caterpillars because I'm just so proud of them. So on the left is a caterpillar that was in the dirt. I don't know what it is. And um, on the right, so this was amazing. I was out patrolling in the yard looking for caterpillars and I saw this caterpillar had been, was being entwined with silk by this spider. And as I watched this little tiny spider um, would run out to the caterpillar, it would sting it, the caterpillar would thrash, the spider would wrap some silk around it and then it would run back to the safety of the interior of the cow parsnip. And this went on for a long time. Um, so it was really epic and something to see in my garden. Here's an umber skipper on a uh, burr marigold, which is an aquatic plant. And we have narrow leaf milkweed in our backyard. And narrow leaf milkweed is a kind that you should be growing if you're gardening here in the Bay Area. And these are the chrysalises of two monarch butterflies. I know the one on the left looked like it's something from ET, but it's really, you know, this amazing, beautiful chrysalis from the monarch. And then on the right, when it's getting ready to emerge, the, the case becomes, excuse me, almost translucent and you can see the wings and that's when you know to start watching. So I was keeping my eye on this chrysalis on the right, which was laid on our patio furniture, as you can tell here. And this very blurry photo is because when I saw the butterfly was emerging, I sprinted into my house 
found my Sandmark lens and my phone. I ran outside screwing the lens on, trying to get the butterfly coming out of its chrysalis. And then I sat there for a long time watching it uh, finish its transformation. So as you can see on the left, this butterfly has these very folded wings and it also has a very large abdomen. So the abdomen contains fluid that the butterfly pumps into its wings. So it has it stayed there for hours, like getting ready to fly. And the adult at right is getting ready for its first flight. So that is the end of this uh, formal presentation. And I'm gonna just put this up here to remind you that if you're supporting this program, if you're enjoying this program, I hope that you support us. And we have a few um, moments for questions. There was a question about the pond and I, I've been to your wonderful yard, Cassie, but I don't remember what's what sort of the size, talk a little more about that. And uh, you don't have fish in it, do you? No. So I've always hoped, a number of my hosts have told me, thank you, sweet, that when they put in a pond that frogs just came, Pacific for, chorus frogs just came. I've been waiting for a long time, but they haven't come to my yard. And uh, if you have fish, you won't also have frogs because the fish eat frogs, eggs, and tadpoles. So I don't have any fish. I hope, I wait hopefully for one day that I will get chorus frogs. Then we have to treat the water because um, it contains uh, chloramine here in the East Bay and you have to get the chloramine out. And I've just never like figured out like how to actually do that on any kind of regular basis. Um, our pond was designed by Kelly Marshall from Kelly Marshall Garden Design. It actually has three parts to it that are kind of connected so we can walk over the pond when it's not too overgrown with aquatic plants, but the water moves between the three. Uh, one of the pieces is higher than the others. A water is constantly flowing from the higher part to the lower part. The water is recirculating. So um, we filled it and um, then Mike set it up so that it's on the uh, connected to um, a water device that is connected to a satellite that knows how much water evaporated the day before. And it just refills automatically at nine o'clock in the morning with water that had evaporated the day before. So I don't have to stand there with a hose and fill it. And in the rain, when it overflows, we have a little swale that carries the water off of our yard. Does that seem like it answered enough about the pond? Yeah, that sounds great. It's it's really gorgeous. Like any water feature, it's just so nice to have in the yard. Let me say that when we, I knew that I wanted a pond because it's just so beautiful to hear trickling water, even if people have just a, uh, you know, a rock, a burbling rock fountain. It sounds nice to us. It brings the birds in. It provides water for birds. I mean, if you think about how wet the East Bay would have been hundreds of years ago when there's seeps and springs everywhere. Berkeley was apparently called the city of springs because wherever people tried to dig, water just came spurted up out of the ground. So bringing, putting fresh water in your garden will bring a lot of birds in. But also our pond is deep. So it's uh, two and a half feet deep, which keeps the water cool. So you don't get so much um, uh, uh, evaporation or algae. And it's also large because uh, two people that I had talked to told me that their regret about their pond was that it was not big enough. Al Kite was one. And um, Michael Filgen told me that people often wish they had put in larger ponds. So ours is pretty big. I think it's 15 feet across at the widest. And it takes up a big chunk of our backyard. But it's such a beautiful uh feature that we just really love it. And seems there's not really any cleaning or I know my bird bath is of, of course very small and I do have to clean out the algae and the bird poop every so often. You don't really do any of that maintenance on the pond, right? I do not. We don't clean it. Mm -hmm. um, the Once in a while something will happen like a branch will grow into, we have a thing called the rivulet which like trickles water uh, 12 hours a day. It's on a timer. Sometimes a leaf will grow in there and it'll like um, bring water out of the pond or leaf litter gets like piled up near the uh, plastic edging and water gets over. But really it's been very carefree. We've had it for the last, I would say 12 to 13 years. And it's just been a fantastic feature in the yard. There's also been some interest in that satellite based evaporation device. The thing that tells how much water needs to go into the pond every day. How does that work? 
uh, it's like a lot of the more modern ones, um, it's hooked into uh, weather forecasts. And so um, if it realizes, as it has a lot in the last few months, that rain is coming, then it will shut off the irrigation. Um, and uh, irrigation systems with that feature now have um, qualify for rebates, either larger rebates or rebates in the first place, um, because water districts, of course, are interested in having folks not watering their gardens when it's pouring out. Um, and so it's a, a great way to save water. Susan's garden, and actually my own as well, were both designed by Ford Mentions Landscape Company. If you would like help designing and installing a native plant garden, you might want to contact Four Dimensions Landscape Company. Four Dimensions is an award-winning landscape design company whose motto is restoring the earth one garden at a time and whose goal it is to bring people and nature together. Four Dimensions creates well-planned, carefully crafted environments that enrich both human and natural life. You can call on Four Dimensions to design, build, or nurture your garden, and you can reach them at fourdimensionslandscape.com or call them at 510-893-1999. If you are watching today and haven't had a chance yet to make a donation, if you'll please support the tour. You can do it on the tour's uh, website under Please Donate. You can Venmo a contribution to at bringing back the natives. We depend upon donations to keep going. And we hope that if you've enjoyed our presentation, that you will help us to keep this event going.